And we can do all three verses. <clears throat> 
Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we try to help people and they just will take it the wrong way. Yeah, and it's hard when it's a co-worker. Because it... Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's right. Sometimes the best thing you can do is avoid people. Yeah. 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 Well, somebody's going to have a chocolate allergy and they're going to, yeah. So make sure y'all talk loud because apparently it's that time of year we turn the air on. And I can't hear over that, that air conditioner. So I'll try to remember to repeat them back to you. But if I forget, just bear with me. I'm not that bright. And anybody else? <laughs> hey, you know it, don't you? Anybody else? Prayer requests or praises? Yes, ma'am. Gotcha. Yeah, well, praise the Lord you didn't break an ankle or a hip or a knee or anything else. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a demon-possessed camper you got right there. You need to get rid, get rid of that thing. Sell it cheap. Anybody want to buy a camper? <laughs> Y'all got any enemies you want to, buy, want to buy a camper? That might be a good one. <laughs> yeah, you and that camper don't get along, do you? And, yes, ma'am. It was a beautiful day today. Praise the Lord. Yes, please pray for our country. Um, folks, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but we are seeing the byproduct of us. That's what we're seeing. And I try to stay out of that realm of political anymore because people just get irate about it. But I really want you to understand we are experiencing what the Bible tells us we will experience when we walk away from God. And so it is what it is. And plus, we're in the last days. This is what the last days looks like. Don't be so surprised about it. We don't have to like it for sure. We need to pray for sure because God is greater. Amen? And so we want to trust the Lord to lead us, guide us, direct us, no matter what's going on in the world. But it is a mess, and we need to pray for our country. Yes, ma'am. Are all these storms natural disasters? According to Jesus, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, they're more oppressive. They're more frequent. It's part... Now, you have to understand, when Jesus was speaking in Matthew 24, he's really talking more about the day of the Lord and the time of the tribulation. But those earth, uh, earthquakes and wars and all that, they, they're birth pangs. And so they're going to continuously uh, get stronger as we get to that time of the tribulation. And in the tribulation, it's going to be full on. The earth is grown and to be delivered, you see. And so part of all that we see with all the natural disasters, the, the violence, the anger, the unnatural affection, all this um, LGBTQ plus stuff, uh, the transgenderism, the wokeism, all of that stuff is, it's not just America, y'all, it's worldwide. And so when you see it worldwide, you know it is part of what Jesus was talking about. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Go ahead, go ahead, Larry. Yeah, go ahead, AJ. All right, pray for San Diego's mom. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Well, you have to understand the monetary system. He's talking about the, the currency changing. Folks, we've run our course. So you had the Dutch system, you had the British system, you had the American system, now you have another system. It just, it runs its course about every 100 years, 100, 125 years. Uh, we ran our course. And so it's nothing different when we're talking a monetary system. Now it does affect us with inflation and all that. But as far as the world goes in the history of the world, that has been the norm 
from the time really of modernization. So don't get too excited about that. Um, your money's worthless anyway. Yeah. Yeah, just keep printing it. That's why stuff that used to cost a dollar costs $10 now. I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. The, we serve the Lord. The Lord will take care of us. The Lord will feed us, right? Remember, in the, the last monetary system was the British pound. And so when the British pound fell to the American dollar, there was tremendous upheaval in Britain. But it didn't end Britain, did it? No. And so we have to understand the people are still there. Um, you know, people adjust. We have to adjust. We have no choice. We have to adjust. As a matter of fact, we don't have much choice of anything anymore, do we? We have adjusted about as far as I care to adjust. But nevertheless, we keep trusting the Lord. Hey, Jesus is coming soon, y'all. He's coming. He's coming. And if not, hey, I'm older than some of you. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm going to be gone. Y'all have to deal with it. <laughs> right? And some of y'all might beat me out of here. But you never know. I'm loaded with stress and everything else and blood pressure and all that stuff. So you never know. I might pop a cork up here one day. and Y'all have one heck of a party when I do. All right. Have some pork barbecue and bacon. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So it's a three-year-old named Gavin. It has a brain issue. Amen. 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 So praise the Lord for, for that. We didn't get to do the funeral, but that's okay. The Lord knows. The Lord knows. I don't know a woman that can preach at all, to be honest with you. So never, that's just me, my opinion, all right? Of course, of course. Anybody else, any prayer? Yes, ma'am. Coworker diagnosed with blood clot? Okay. So she had a bad reaction to the medicine, end up in the hospital? That's, that's not good. Someone else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and who is it again? Thank you. Your, your mom's best friend. Okay. Okay. So remember her, that lady with the degenerative brain issue. Pray for that family. Pray for her. Pray for her husband. Anybody else? Anybody want to open us up in prayer tonight? Daniel. Daniel. <laughs> Boy, Daniel, you volunteered quick tonight. And your voice changed, and your voice changed yeah. Amen. All right, so this week and next week, we're going to be on tongues and uh, this, uh, this understanding of modern day tongues, okay? I want you to realize, and you guys can go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to read you something out of Acts chapter number 2, just a few short verses. But I want you to understand the, what you see as modern day tongues, uh, it is something that has not been seen since about 70 A.D. until the late 1800s, early 1900s. You never saw it. There was a small outbreak of it in the 
uh, the, the late eight, uh, 1780s or something like that. Um, but it was more or less of a, a, a very strange band of Christians. And it was just a, it wasn't exactly like modern day tongues. It was, it was a little bit bizarre. Uh, but nevertheless, you don't see what we call modern day tongues until uh, the 19th century. And really coming prevalent in the 20th century. This is important for you to understand because it's part of the last day's deception. And I want you to realize that there are a lot of good people, there are a lot of people that are saved, that have been taught to speak in tongues. They are told, make these sounds, keep making these sounds until you're fluent in making your sounds. And if you've listened to tongues, you'll find out there's two kinds of tongues. There's one kind of tongues that is very much spiritual. And I'm not talking about a good spiritual. I'm talking the utterances, the noises, the sounds are the exact same thing as you hear in voodooism, in Hinduism with the kundalini, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. That's a demonic thing. And I hope you understand that. If they're making the same words and the same sounds to worship what, who they think is God, as someone who practices voodoo or is involved in kundalini in uh, Indian, Native Indian worship, Native American Indians do this as they worship uh, the spirit world. And folks, that's demonic. The other kind of tongues is what you see mostly when you turn on the television and you're watching the modern day charismatics and they're making noises and, you know, they're laughing and, and, and all that stuff. All that crazy stuff. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That is taught. That is taught. And so they're involved in that. It's, it's, it's okay in their congregations. It's okay in their circles of influence. They learn it there. They do it there. And they, they are taught this. Folks, tongues in the Bible is a gift from God. Nobody can teach you a gift. Either you have that or you don't have that. Is everybody okay? And so you're going to see that. If not tonight, you're going to see it this week. Now, I want you to understand there are a lot of Christian people, people who truly are saved, that believe in speaking in tongues because they've been taught this. Understand, we don't evaluate their salvation based on whether they have been taught to speak in tongues or not, but what they believe about Jesus. Is everybody with me on that? So salvation is by grace through faith. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. None of us has the inside scoop on 100% of everything. But there are some things that are just obviously wrong that people are taught to do. You do realize there are people who are, are actually Christian people who have put their trust and faith in Jesus but have been told and taught different isms and schisms and different strange things. You realize that, right? There are people in the Catholic Church who are saved. Catholicism is not Christianity. And so we have to understand that. We also have to understand there are people in the Church of Christ that are saved. They're trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone, but they're taught they have to be baptized in water in order to make it right. And then that's where the confusion comes in in what they're taught. And so we've got to differentiate this right from the get-go tonight so that we don't bash anyone. We have to understand we have brothers and sisters who do this. And it's because they've been taught to do this and they think they're doing something spiritual that helps them. But in essence, all it does is add confusion into the mix and God is not the author of confusion. Everybody follow me so far? So you're in 1 Corinthians 14. Let me just read Acts chapter 2, just a few verses. This is the beginning. This is where we find tongues. Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, just as the Lord told them to do, to wait for the promise of the Comforter. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. This is a miracle. 
This is a miraculous thing. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. This is the sending of the Comforter. This is a one-time event. Everybody with me on that? And there were, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. This is the miracle of tongues, all right? And so as we understand the miracle of tongues, there are some stipulations, there are guidelines, there are rules, there are things that in this movement of tongues we have to understand. Number one, the modern day tongues is looking to, to do tongues, to speak in tongues, to have an outer experience, another experience, something other than just being satisfied with salvation. And so understand that in the time of the upper room, in the day of Pentecost, when the gift of tongues was given, it was given for a specific purpose. There were devout Jews everywhere from other nations. And when these men were given the gift of tongues. They could speak about Jesus, speak the gospel, and clarify who Jesus was to people from any and every nation. That's what tongues was for. So tongues has not ever changed. Now there are two types of of tongues in the church. We talked about that spiritual, which is evil. We talked about the same utterances and guttural sounds and stuff that people who worship demons use. Then you have that taught stuff. And the only reason you have those two types is because they cannot have, they do not have this gift anymore. That's not to say, and we'll talk about this as we go through this, that's not to say that God cannot do something miraculous, like a missionary on a foreign field who just speaks the language. God can do something like that. Because God can do whatever God wants to do for people to hear the gospel, and I hope you realize that. There have been instances and recorded instances where missionaries went to the field, didn't even believe in speaking in tongues, went to the field and they had not been in language school for the language they encountered, but God just somehow made them understand and able to give the gospel to people with a weird, unknown to them language. That's a miracle of God. God is still able to do that. And we're not going to cut God short. And the ability for people to be able to have that when God gives that to people. But that is a rare exception. It's not the rule. As a matter of fact, in the first part of the, the 19th century, when, or the latter part of the 19th century, when, when this matter of speaking in tongues started becoming prevalent uh, in the Pentecostal church, they thought they were so confident that these sounds they were making were another language that they would send people off to foreign countries without ever learning the language and they failed miserably because when they went to those countries, they couldn't speak the languages they thought they were speaking. And the reason was is because it was gibberish and nonsense. So they had to bring them all back home and train them in the language and then send them back on the mission field. It was a colossal Pentecostal failure. And folks, that is a matter of historical record. Everybody okay with that? And so we have to understand this. So then we come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians is a good study for us to start with because in 1 Corinthians, the people were doing much the same as what we have today. You have to understand that those gifts were still in force. The canon of Scripture has not been completed. The, the, the understanding has not been, been given. The, the total enlightenment of the, the truth of God through the Word of God has not been given to the people. They still had these gifts. 
the gift of prophecy, you know, have a word of knowledge, the gift of speaking in tongues. Not everybody was given the same gift. And this is important for us to understand before we study anything else tonight. You're going to see it a little later on. But not everybody's given the same gift. Not everybody in the church today is given the same gift. There are some who have the gift of hospitality. There are some who have the gift of, of giving, of, of showing compassion. There are others who have gifts of a musical ability or speaking ability, teaching ability. Others have gifts to build things, fix things, and so forth. All these gifts work together in the church so that the church functions as a whole body. Make sense? And so as we understand this, in Corinth, this was the problem. Everybody wanted the sensational gift. Everybody wanted to speak in tongues. And when everybody wanted to speak in tongues, what was taking place is much like you will see in many modern charismatic churches, is that everybody was jibber-jabbering in a, in a tongue. Folks, the Bible makes it expressly clear, and you're going to see this this week or next week. There are rules for speaking in tongues. And I'm going to let you know what they are right off the bat, and we're going to talk about them more in the, in the, in, in the future here. Number one, no more than two or three people could speak in tongues, and they had to do it one at a time. There had to be an interpreter present, and the interpreter had to be able to interpret what the person speaking in tongues was saying, and whomever the tongues was for had to also agree with the interpreter. That's why you had to have an interpreter. You see. Everybody wanted to speak in tongues. Nobody wanted to be an interpreter. The third thing is this. Women kept silent. Women were not to prophesy and women were not to speak in tongues. Look at modern day charismaticism. What do you have? You have women leading the churches, women preaching, women elders, and women speaking in tongues. Folks, it's against the word of God. You have to understand, this isn't Pastor Paul. I'm not being a meanie. I'm telling you, there's rules. There's, there's ways that we do things. And there's reasons we don't do things. And this is where we're going. 1 Corinthians 14. Notice a few key verses. Drop down into about the 21. In the law it is written, uh, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. That comes from Isaiah 28, 11 and 12. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying or preaching, forthtelling, uh, serveth not them that believe not, but for them which believe. If therefore the whole church come, be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say, you're mad? Have you ever been to a Pentecostal or charismatic revival? Yes. Then you'll understand exactly that phrase, will you not? Because I'm telling you, some of the best preaching you'll ever hear is in those churches. The madness comes at the end when everybody has to speak in tongues and everybody has to be slain in the spirit and everybody has to have some manifestation of a gift and everybody, everybody has to experience it or else somebody's got their hands on you praying for you and one of them will be praying to let go and another one will be praying for you to hold on. <laughs> Trust me, we've been there. Amen? But if all prophesy, speaking forth that which God says, but if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. For so falling down on his face, notice this, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Where you find the tongues movement, you will also find people falling out. And which way do they fall, people? They fall backwards. As a matter of fact, they, those churches have catchers. Many of them wear white gloves. They have little towels to throw over you, little blankets if you're a woman, and you fall out to cover you, right? But you fall out backwards. Folks, when you worship God and you fall under the power of God, you fall upon your face. 
You don't fall backwards. Every time in the Bible when people fall backwards, they are under the judgment of Almighty God, the condemnation of God. It is not worship to God. It is God showing us it's not worship. Everybody with me? Okay? Are you really with me? Now, folks, I want you to know, I've, I've been to Pentecostal revivals. I've been to charismatic revivals. I've been around Pentecostals and charismatics since I've been saved. And I can tell you this. I can take them to the scripture. I can show them the scripture. And this is what they're going to say. Well, I know what I feel. I know what I experience. I know, I know that when I just start speaking, it just comes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I could do that, too, if I wanted to. And so could you. You keep making the same sounds, it's going to keep coming out of you. How do you think you learned to speak as it was? You emulated sound. And when we hear that stuff around us, we emulate it. Now, there is a crowd of people that says they're using their heavenly language. We're going to talk about that. A heavenly language, and I want to just throw the cat right out there. Every time in the Bible you see an angel speak to people, the angel speaks in the language of those people. Every time you see an angel speak in the Old Testament, it's in Hebrew. Every time you see an angel speak in the New Testament, it's in Aramaic or Greek. Y'all get this, right? When we get to heaven, when we get to heaven, the differences are going to be broken down. Remember, we got different languages because of our rebellion. It was in the land of Shinar. It was at a place called the Tower of Babel. And where man decided that man was going to build this tower to God. Why? Because man wanted to elevate himself and make himself like God. It's there that God confounded the languages. And that confounding of the language drew people away. But guess what? Every time you read what somebody says before, before the Tower of Babel, guess what language it's in? It's in Hebrew. Hebrew language is the only language known to human beings whereby a man cannot cuss God or curse God in Hebrew. In order for a Jew who speaks Hebrew to curse God or cuss God, He's got to interject Arabic languages into it or English or whatever. And so he has to interject that in because there's no cursing of God in Hebrew. Isn't that interesting? All right. So when we go through this, understand this is where we are. So verse 26, he says, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. Why is it when you come together, everybody wants to talk, everybody wants to be sensational, everybody's got to have their say. And this doesn't edify anybody. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course, meaning only one at a time. Whenever there's tongues spoken in church, only one person should be speaking it at a time. That knocks it in the head, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. In other words, this is where they get this angelic heavenly language. I'm just speaking to myself and speaking to God. So we have family that speak in tongues. When you pray and you hold their hand, they're, they're jabbering away, but they don't do it real loud. The reason they don't do it real loud, they're talking to themselves and to God. All right? They were taught that. Is everybody with me? Are they saved? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're saved, just as saved as I am. Are they on their way to heaven? Yes. Are they wrong? I think so. But when they do it that way, and they use that verse for it, you know what we're supposed to do? Not judge them. Now, when they come into church, if somebody stands up at church and starts shamalama ding dong and yabba dabba doing, I'm going to tell them to stop. I have done it before. Here. When somebody comes to the altar and they're praying and they start speaking in tongues, I'm going to tap them on the shoulder and I'm going to say, stop it. You know what they're going to do? They're going to stop. You know why? 
Because it's not of God. If it was of God, I couldn't stop it. You understand? Okay? And so I stopped that. If you want to speak in tongues, do it like the Bible says, to yourself and to God. We don't need to hear it. It doesn't edify us. There's no interpreter here. Therefore, hush. Don't do it without an interpreter. Amen? Amen. All right. So that's biblical. Notice what it says. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. So why does everybody want to be the preacher? Everybody had some, some prophetic thing they wanted to say. Have you ever been in an environment like that where everybody's got a prophecy? Well, I just got a word of, of prophecy, brother. And I, the Lord said this to me. No, he didn't. God does not speak to you. He'll impress upon your heart to do things, to surrender things, to behave yourself. But God does not speak to you in an audible voice. He speaks to you through His Word. And if what you say, God said, does not line up with the Word that's already written, it's not of God. That's why the Bible says to try the spirits. Put them on trial. Because folks, I'm here to tell you, if you want to have an experience, if you want to have some kind of insight and knowledge, the devil and the demons will be glad to give it to you. As a matter of fact, we went to a church in Harrisonburg. I'm just going to throw this out there before we go any further. Went to a church in Harrisonburg and the pastor, he, he befriended me and I, I, really, I really cared for the man personally. But as we were there for a while, things just didn't line up, didn't add up. And I asked him about his salvation. His salvation testimony was a little shaky. I asked him about being called to the ministry. And he said, I think it was in our house, it might have been somewhere else. But he told Jill and I, I, I was sitting at the, on the pier. And this man jogged by me. And he was young. Went to the end of the pier. When he jogged by me, he was old. And I took that as a sign from God that I'm supposed to be a preacher. Where's that? Where's that? What is that? Hello? He's the same man that also said he went on a trip to, to Israel and he was by the Jordan River and he saw a dove land in a tree and God spoke to him and told him that's a direct descendant of the dove that brought the Holy Spirit to Jesus. That's not biblical. The Holy Spirit came down as a dove. A dove didn't bring down the Holy Spirit. You understand? That's wackadoodle stuff. Now I want you to understand something, folks. If you want knowledge, the devil will give it to you. I can tell you this from experience, knowing this man. I had people in the church come to me and go, I don't know how, but he just knows what I'm doing. He knows when I do something bad. He knows when I do something wrong. He knows when I'm not right. And he'll call me. That's not of God. As a matter of fact, I experienced it one time. We were in North Carolina. I was pastor in North, Carolina, in North Carolina. I'd had a particularly rough day that day. I think I'd probably kicked something, cussed something, threw something, broke something. You know, people in North Carolina can irritate you, just like people in Virginia, right? <laughs> had a bad day and all of a sudden the phone rang and it was him and he said the Lord just told me that you're angry today no he didn't no he didn't no he didn't the Lord didn't tell you nothing the devil told you come on the Lord didn't tell you I did anything wrong because what I do wrong ain't none of your business now, the Lord don't tell people when you do something wrong. Because you are saved and washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb of God. Are y'all listening? Now, all of this charismatic stuff, all this charismania stuff, all of this stuff goes hand in hand. And some of it is not too far stretched from clairvoyancy, from New Ageism, from the Kundalini of Hinduism. And so you've got to be very careful when you are dealing with people who speak in tongues because you only have those two kinds. You have the kind that have been taught 
and bless God, they're just going to do it because they want to be close to God and they want to do everything they can to, to be in God's favor and they want to show God love. And all of those crowd, every one of them, I've never yet met anybody that speaks in tongues who does not believe you can lose your salvation. Interesting, isn't it? So they have to have these experiences in order to justify, in order to say, see, I must be right. I do this. I experience this. I know what I felt. Right? Just like when you ask them, did you lose your salvation? They didn't ever lose their salvation if they're saved to start with. What do they say? I know how I felt. You don't know how I felt. Well, I felt like I've not been saved a lot of times. Amen? Everybody with me? All right. Are you ready to start this? If not, too late. <laughs> Number one, I want you to see this. It's always a sign for unbelievers. Speaking in tongues was always a sign for unbelievers. It has nothing to do with believers. We don't need the gift of tongues. We know who Jesus is. We know the gospel. We're saved. We have the Holy Spirit of God in, inside of us. We don't need anybody around us speaking in tongues. We're already saved. Look at this. It always points to the gospel. Look at verse 22 one more time. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Let me stop right there. The Bible tells us that sign gifts were given, and we're going to talk uh, about the fact that they're given for, for the Jews. The Jews, the Bible says, required a sign. And so all of these sign gifts were given for the Jews to see the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus walked the earth, I want you to understand all of those miracles that Jesus did. From raising Lazarus to, to healing Malchus's ear to, to the, you know, the everything, the, the blind seeing, the, the deaf could hear, the lepers made whole. All of those things were sign gifts to the nation of Israel to prove to them that Jesus is God in the flesh. He was their long-awaited for Messiah. Now, the speaking in tongues comes in after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It comes 50 days after. That's Pentecost, 50 so Jesus has gone up to the Father. He walked on the earth for 40 days and he showed himself alive to many. On the 50th, he goes up and the, the two angels say, you men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? This same Jesus will come in like manner. And what did Jesus say? He said, occupy till I come. He told them to be in the, to, together in the upper room and to be praying the, the comforter would come. That's exactly where they were. They were in Jerusalem. They were praying. They were waiting on the comforter. So the sign gift is for the nation of Israel. Jesus said it's a wicked and a perverse generation that seeks after a sign. There's only one sign that's going to be given that's going to last. And that sign is, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, the Son of Man would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And just as sure as that whale got rid of Jonah, the earth got rid of Jesus. Actually, Jesus had power over it, you understand. But we are worshiping a risen living Savior. The Jews did not understand who Jesus was. When Jesus died on the cross, it was a curse to the nation of Israel. Cursed is every man who, who dieth upon the tree. The reason being it was a curse. They, they thought that Jesus was a blasphemer. They thought that Jesus was a phony and a fraud because he died between two thieves. And no matter what, no matter how, no matter the intensity that the apostles and the, the people tried to preach and teach, that Jesus was resurrected, he was God, he died for a reason, and was resurrected, they wouldn't believe. So in the Old Testament, this stuff is prophesied. It's prophesied in Isaiah. It's prophesied in the book of Joel. And so those Jews would have known Isaiah, and those Jews would have known Joel. And so when these sign gifts came, it was to show that the power of God was upon this group of people 
and they had the presence of God, the power of God, and they needed to heed their message of God. And so it was for the nation of Israel. Remember, the gospel is to the Jew first and also the Greek. It's never changed. We should do everything in our power to get the gospel to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. Everybody with me on that? All right. So tongues are a not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying, the preaching of God's word, uh, serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Christ crucified, right? We preach the cross. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Amen? Amen. All right. So understand that first and foremost, this sign is for unbelievers. And he made it very clear. When the, the tongues came, it was for the unbelievers in the upper room. When the sign gift of tongues was used in the, this transitional time, it was used to tell unbelievers and to show unbelievers. Why? Because I can't speak Spanish. I can't speak French. I know a few cuss words and that's about it. I can't speak Czechoslovakian, whatever that is, or Polish, or Russian. But during that particular time, remember all of those disciples, the apostles, they spoke Hebrew, they spoke Aramaic. They didn't speak those languages either. But there were devout Jews because of the holy days from all over the known world. And the Jews needed to hear about their Messiah. And so all of a sudden, they spoke. And the first sign gift was they spoke and the people heard it in their own language. They didn't even speak it in that language. They heard it in that language. So it'd be like this. We're in the upper room. All of a sudden there's a sound. There's a mighty rushing wind. There's cloven tongues of fire that's set upon us. And then all of a sudden we start speaking. I'm talking English. And I'm saying about the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus has come. The Messiah has come. And you're from every other language. Everybody in here is from a different country. And as I speak English, you hear me in your language. That was the first sign gift. After that, we see them going out into the world. And they had the ability to speak in that language, understand that language, and the people had the ability to hear in their language. It's an amazing, miraculous thing. Never for saved, always for the lost. Everybody good with point one? Yeah. Number two, it's always for the Jew. The sign gifts are for the Jew. Every time tongues are used, a Jew has to be present. So if you're in a church and somebody starts yabba dabba doing shamalama ding dong it, and there is not an interpreter, shut them down. If there's not a Jew present, shut them down. Because the sign is for the lost, the sign is for the Jew, and there has to be an interpreter. Everybody with me? All right? And so it's for the Jews, which were scattered. Remember, these devout Jews were scattered of the, of, of the dispersion. Remember what happened? We go back to the Old Testament. The first thing that we see, the, the Jews come out of Egypt, right? They go into the promised land. Then something happens a little later. They go into captivity. There, remember, there's Babylonian captivity. There's Assyrian captivity. The ones who were in Babylonian captivity came back. The ones who were in Assyrian captivity, many of them are still dispersed. That's where the Jews that are in Russia come from. They're still dispersed, people. Does everybody understand that? So there are Jews all over the world that never came back to their homeland. And then in A.D. 70, something else happened. All of a sudden, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and drove the people out. And so there was another diaspora, another dispersion that's going to take place. At this particular time, that dispersion had not happened. This is only a short while 
after the beginning of the church. The temple was still in business. The people were still in Jerusalem. They were still sacrificing and still going to their temple. These other Jews who had made pilgrimages to the Holy Land, these men, these women, were given this sign gift to be able to witness, to lead people to Jesus from other languages, other Jews. 1 Corinthians 14, 21 says this, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. That's a quote from Isaiah 28. And so it was prophesied in the Old Testament that there would come a time when this would happen. This is what he's talking about. And as it comes to be, these people or this people is always a representative of God's people. This people is the nation of Israel, but yet they are, have other lips and other tongues. Now look, all of us in here, we look different. Some of you look real different. We all got lips, don't we? But they're the same thing. They're shaped different. When he's talking about lips, other lips, he's talking about pronunciations of words. And other tongues, the word is glossalia. And it literally means other languages. It also, when you see the word tongues, there's other words that are used. And some of them are, one of them is phaneo, where we get the word phonetics from. Interesting, isn't it? Everybody with me? So they spoke other phonetic languages. They had other lips. They had other pronunciations. You ever listen to uh, uh, somebody from a tribal region of Africa that has a click language? And they, that's interesting, man. They click. Instead of making sounds, like they, they'll click a letter. So if they click their, their T's, it would be, instead of saying the dog jumped over the cat, it would be, it'd be over the like that. That's weird. I can't even hardly do it, right? But they do it natural because they have other lips and they have other phonetics. Everybody with me, I know you are, right? This is elementary stuff, the beginning stuff, very elementary, but we've got to understand the elementary in order to understand the deeper. Number three, tongues are temporary. Now, I want you to understand that very, very carefully. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 8 through 12. Charity, and the word charity is the word agape, agape love. It's love. It's sacrifice in action. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that, the word that is a definite article, it's a thing, not a person, okay? When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. Now when this was written, we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. So there's two different revealings of this. And there's two different understandings of the temporary. One is when that which is perfect has come. When that which is perfect has come, a definite article, we're talking about the perfect law of liberty, the Bible. But then when we know as we are known, that's when we're glorified. So I want you to understand this. Is everybody comprehending what I'm saying? The word faileth, cease, vanish away, katergeo. It means to render useless, to make idle, to finish. So understand exactly what the Bible's saying. Because for many years... Many years, I was confused about this, like probably many of you are, right? Or were, or have been. Notice the language. Let's put this into the context. 
Look back with me one more time at, that, at those verses. Charity never is rendered useless. Agape love can never be rendered useless. It, it's never made idle. But where there be tongues, or excuse me, where there be prophecies, that is, is that God's going to speak to someone and they're going to reveal it. Isn't that what Paul is doing right here? Isn't that what Paul and John, John the Revelator, Peter, right? They're writing the scripture. The office, the gift of prophecy, the office of the apostle had the prophetic. And so God gave them men of renown, men of old, spake as the Holy Ghost moved upon them. The Bible is inerrant, infallible. It is inspired by God. And so these men who are writing the Word of God are given inspiration of God. But that is going to cease. It's going to go useless and idle. There's nothing new under the sun. And there's no new canon of Scripture. Nobody gets a new word of anything from God. The Bible is the final authority. Is everybody with me on that? Let's keep going. They shall cease. Uh, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. They will be rendered useless. They shall be made idle. There's no need for it now. You have no need for it. They're made idle. They're finished. That does not mean that God cannot do something. But God never goes against His Word. Make sense? So nobody needs to speak forth Scripture anymore. Nobody needs to have a prophecy to come to the nation and speak a word of prophecy over the nation when the Bible's already complete. And the same thing with speaking in tongues. We don't need to go to a foreign field and speak and hope that they hear us in, our, in their language or hope that we have this miraculous gift that we just speak and we speak their language. Why? That stuff's idle now. It's useless. That's why we translate the Bible into other languages. That's why we send missionaries to language school to learn the language of people, to be able to translate the Bible into their language, to be able to share with them the truth in their language. Everybody with me? Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, the word of knowledge. How many of y'all been watching Creflo Dollar or, or Benny Hinn or, or, or Kenneth Copeland? And they say, I've got a word of knowledge. They're liars. All that's rendered useless, it's made idle. There's no need for that anymore. We have the complete canon of Scripture. But I want you to understand what it says now. Look very carefully. Tongues are temporary. Three views of this and we're done tonight. Three views. Number one is the cessation view. That means that when the canon of Scripture was complete, these gifts cease. Now that's not exactly what the Bible says, does it? There's the non-cessation. That means the gifts are still given but on a limited scale until Christ returns. That's not exactly what the Bible says either, is it? Then there's the continuationist. There's no salvation without them being evident in believers' lives. That's not in the Bible either, is it? Absolutely not. So where do we stand on this? We stand on this biblically. Look, there's a division between verse 11 down through 13. Or verse 10 down through verse 13. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Done away means to cease. Katargeo, to be idle, to be made useless, rendered useless. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. So as I learn, I don't need the things I needed when I was a child. For now we see through a glass darkly. Now, while he's writing the scripture, while he is writing this to the book of, to the Corinthians, the first book of Corinthians, to this church that's all jacked up, they only see a limited thing. They don't see everything. They will not see everything until they're glorified. So understand what the Bible's saying. The Bible says all of those things are going to be ceased, made idle when that which is perfect is come, which is the perfect law of liberty, the complete canon of Scripture. 
But we know now, the Corinthians, you're like children. You're playing like children. But you've got to grow up and become adults. When you become adults, then you don't need all these experiences, emotions, and feelings. You walk in the realm of faith. Faith is the word pistis, which equals facts. And you walk in the world of facts. Right now, you only know a little bit. But there's coming a day you're going to know more. You're going to grow and put away childish things until the day that we're glorified. We will know as we're known. What does that mean? That means that I will know you and I will know myself as Christ knows me. But we will hold no grudges. We will not hold any secrets Everything's going to be brought to light. Everything's going to be known. Everything's going to be okay because we're going to have a body like Christ, a mind like Christ, and a heart like Christ. Everybody with me? Now I want you to understand, all this stuff is idle. It's all idle because we need to walk by faith. We need to grow up. We need to be mature. We need to put away this foolishness. Everybody wanted to jibber-jabber. Everybody wanted to have a prophecy. Everybody wanted to have the preeminent place because they were like little children. Paul says, grow up and keep growing up until the day God finishes you. And when God finishes you, notice what he says. Right now, verse 13, now abides faith, hope, charity. These three but the greatest of these is charity. Stop looking for emotionalism, experientialism, feelings. Stop looking for the preeminent things. Stop being children and learn that there's three things you need to focus on. Your faith, your hope, and your charity. Your faith is founded in Jesus. Your hope is in the appearance of Jesus. And your charity is God in you at work through you. It's not about speaking in tongues. It's about being a mature believer in Jesus. When you actually grow up, you'll put that stuff away. Until then, you're going to stay immature and childish. Get it? Got it? Good. Next week, we'll start with number four. Tongues are always a known language. This is the good stuff. All right. Before we go, anybody have a quick question? Because I know it's time to go. Anybody? All right. Who would like to pray us out? Daniel, you can pick somebody.